Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Radical Therapist Podcast. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hey, why, don't, why don't we start uh, maybe by having you just kind of quickly introduce yourself so our audio listeners can, you know, put a name to a voice kind of thing before we get started. Who wants to go first? I go alphabetical, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, who are you? <laughs> sure. Hi, I'm Kristen Benson. I'm the program director of the Marriage and Family Therapy Program at Appalachian State University, um, at least for the next six months. Um, and uh, as of tomorrow, we'll be a professor. Um, my, my, yeah. Um, what else? Gosh, y'all, I'm sorry. I'm stumbling. That was perfect. Congratulations, okay. by the way. <laughs> Thanks. So. Uh, you made me go alphabetically. Now I have to look at everybody. Julie, uh, or David. <laughs> I, I, I'm David Nyland. Uh, pronounce he him. I am in Sacramento, and I'm a professor of social work at Cal State Sacramento, and one of the co-founders and clinical directors of the Gender Health Center, which serves the trans and queer communities. Awesome, Julie. And I'm Julie Tilson, and I'm a therapist uh, in, on the traditional lands of the Dakota peoples, also known as Minneapolis, Minnesota. Wonderful. And Julie is a radical therapist alumni, so thanks for coming back. And um, all right, let's get started. You all have a chapter in the forthcoming book, the Root, Root Wedge International Handbook of Postmodern Therapies, which is titled Queering therapeutic conversations more than affirmative and not just for queers. And I'm wondering if we could start by uh, what do you mean when you say more than affirmative and not just for queers? Oh, <laughs> that, oh that, okay. Yeah. So this is Julie. Um, I, I mean, my thoughts on that are just that we, you know, kind of the, the, the typical, the conventional uh, vernacular in therapy fields is to talk about affirmative therapy for LGBT people. Um, and I know for myself and, and my conversations with Chris and Dave, I mean, affirming our clients or the communities we work with seems like a pretty obvious low bar that should sort of be baked into all our work. And so affirming someone doesn't seem like enough. And so we're wanting to imagine and extend our practices beyond the notion of affirmation. And in terms of more than just for queers, um, when we talk about um, queering our practices and accessing queer theory as conceptual resources, you know, we're understanding, you know, we're, we're, we're working on the discursive level of things and the discourses that specify and limit stuff for queer and trans folks also specify and limit stuff for straight and cis folks as well. Mm -hmm. And so when we say more than just, uh, what the hell did we say, uh, more for more than queer, whatever that not is. Just for queers, not just for queers. Not just for queers. Thank you. Um, I'm in that space where I'm either I've either had too much coffee or not quite <laughs> enough. So um, when we say not just for queers, we're acknowledging that um, we're wanting to use the conceptual resources and the practices um, that we're talking about in this chapter um, uh, for all, all folks because all folks mm -hmm. are. Uh, embedded within these discursive um, uh, and lim limiting systems of gender, sexuality, kinship structures, identity, things like that. Awesome. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, uh, you you write that some of the key, you kind of start the chapter by writing that some of the key considerations for queer theory that organize your work around include several ideas, but, you know, feminist and constructionist accounts of gender that denaturalize gender and examine the ways in which power operates within discourses of gender interrogation of normativity and honoring non-normative and non-normative practices, uh, disrupting binary specif specifications of all kinds, not just those that involve gender and sexuality, resisting bioessentialism. Um, I wonder if you could say more about these ideas that, that inform your work. That's a lot. Um, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. big, big question. Um, I, I'll start with... Uh, you know, situating myself as a, a white cis straight male, um, that uh, queer theory can really be an important and meaningful and maybe essential conceptual and ethical frame to work, uh, both as, as a therapist, as a supervisor, as a teacher, and also as a citizen. But I want to um, 
be mindful that I could appropriate queer theory and um, and and benefit from its academic um, appeal, I guess, without really uh, acknowledging the material power differences. So I, I mean, I think that's important. But I I like how queer theory moves beyond just gender and sexuality. I think that's one of the uh, key points in the chapter is it can be used both um, in supervision training, also in therapy to unpack uh, binaries that are taken for granted in our field, like uh, functional, dysfunctional. Um, there's so many, but I think that can help. The queer theory has a framework and a vocabulary for unpacking binaries, not just gender and sexuality, include that, but many other taken for granted discourses, both in therapeutic practice, but just in general. Yeah, life in general. Right. Any I think other it, yeah. In a radical way, I think beyond even many of our postmodern approaches, moves us out of the assumptions that both dictate the way that we engage in therapeutic practices, but also the way that clients understand who they are in the world and allows for more freedom when we can get out of the either or, where we can move away from the assumptions of how people are supposed to be. And if they're not this way, how they're supposed to be in this other way, like there's a right way to be even queer. There's a right way right way. And and who's defining, who's deciding the, in terms of the power structures, who decides what that right way is and who gets left out um, when we start to collectively embrace without critical thoughts and without a critical lens, um, what those rules are and, and how they, you know, essentially benefit some people and don't benefit others um, if they go unchallenged. Right. David, can you say more about, um, just out of my curiosity, like, um, because I'm white, straight, cis, male as well. Who I'm sorry, Chris. <laughs> who, uh, you know, I'm very interested in like, you know, disrupting the binaries in all areas, right, in all contexts and that kind of thing. But, uh, but you said something about, you know, appropriating that type of thing. And, you know, and, and I know sometimes that might, you know, have people take a step back from these ideas and or whatever. How do we how do we move more mindfully maybe into, you know, you know, somebody like you or I, you know, in positions of power, I'm a clinical director, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, just being a, a, attentive to that, but also really leaning into it too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a good question. I let's see if I got a couple of thoughts. Um, one is um, that, you know, queer theory, has a legacy that privileges uh, whiteness and folks in the academy, it's highly intellectual. Okay, yeah. Sometimes the writing can be rather dense. So it's not necessarily applicable or accessible for queer communities outside of the academy, uh, but it can feel good. Like my PhD is in cultural studies. We can get into these rich uh, theoretical conversations, but there's no, no consequences to me as there is for like trans and queer bodies or BIPOC folks. So that's, one idea. I think the second is um, in our field, especially like I'm going to speak for social work, right? And, and its commitment to social justice. Um, there's this more radical um, tradition in social work. There's this more liberal, uh, normative, that individualist perspective that is about like professionalizing being an ally. And I think we can get seduced into thinking that being an ally as a white cis guy you're you're doing your job but um there's a great article by g patterson who's a non-binary uh, i think out of kent state talks about the ally industrial complex where you can benefit materially from being an ally but it's not really including the folks in the marginalized communities you're talking about writing about so i think it requires an interrogation of what constitutes an ally maybe moving towards something like what G. Patterson refers to and some others like a co-conspirator hmm. or an accomplice or an advocate to really, really um, amplify the voices of your working with. So those are a couple ideas. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you you write that, and I think this is important, you write the querying therapy practices starts with querying educational training systems. And um, a couple of you are in academia, and I know Julia does 
do training, you know, and, and writes a lot. And I mean, I mean, how do we begin this? How do we queer therapist training? What's the way through? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I mean, we can start just by looking at how we can have what would be considered a quality training program that is accredited um, without much critical thought um, in terms of how have we come to understand how our models have developed, who developed them, what are the assumptions that underlie um, the way that we think about people, problems, and change, how those evolved over time. Um, we can we can teach all of the things, right? We can meet all of the standards um, in a way that very much um, reaffirms the existing social structures and power structures. Um, and so to deconstruct that, to um, think about not only how are we admitting students, what are our access points into our graduate programs, but what do our curriculums look like? Who are our students reading? Um, you know, and how are they learning to think? Uh, I think the critical thinking piece, it's beyond critical thinking piece, but also um, very much informed by critical thinking so that we, we conceptualize training differently. Um, we can very easily maintain a, a monolithic uh, population of clinicians. And we, we are fairly monolithic currently mm -hmm. um, uh, because if we think about even where like the location of our training programs, they tend to be at predominantly white institutions, many of which are in kind of rural areas. Um, uh, you know, the access points in terms of the cost of education right now, um, what are the standards to which we admit people into training programs? So we can keep talking about wanting to change the way we our practices as clinicians, um, our population as clinicians. But if we don't change the way we think about training from the point that students are recruited, admitted, trained, practicing, interning, we don't think about all of those pieces through a, a deconstructed lens, we're, we're going to continue to do more of the same. And quite frankly, we have a pretty problematic history, right? I mean, psychology in general, mental health treatment in general, the very people that we are writing about and supporting, and some of us are part of the community, um, have not always had a, a great time working in our profession with professionals. Um, so I think it's um, querying training programs um, for me as a program director means positioning myself differently in terms of accountability um, and taking responsibility for what are the underlying messages of what we're training, how we're training, um, how students are positioned, um, what kind of voice they have in training programs. Um, I could kind of ramble on, so I don't know where I might cut myself off and maybe invite uh, Julie or Dave to, to jump in there. But I think um, the, my final point that I'll say before before inviting someone else is um, when I think about the classes, when I'm in a, a classroom setting, how do I think about the learners that are in that room? How am I paying attention to the power structures in academia itself? How that plays out in the classroom? How that frames and shapes the way people participate? Who gets to participate? Who has? Who gets to have voice? Who doesn't have voice? What goes unspoken? Um, all of those things become points of inquiry, and I think that's a very different way than you know if we think about Paulo Freire's work, like um, in critical the the critical. The critical lens he brought to education where we assume students are empty vessels, we're going to teach them the things, and then they can go out and do the work. Like it, it holds us to a different place in terms of accountability and inquiry. Yeah. So I think that whatever, you know, sort of a, 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 um, a foundational um, uh, concept and aspiration, I think that the three of us bring to how we operationalize queer theory is this notion of interrogating power and you know asking what's not inquiring where inquiry hasn't happened before or about things that haven't happened before so um chris whether you're asking like in this case about training in particular when we're going to get more into practice you know or supervision you know so it's this fundamental piece where we start as kristen was saying about inquiring around power and 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 so I, as Kristen, as you were talking, you know, I, I was thinking about, oh, it was 2015 when, you know, Dulwich brought me out to Adelaide 
to, to teach a bit of some of these ideas in their um, program. And, um, you know, they have a, a, a partnership with the University of Melbourne uh, uh, where they matriculate Aboriginal students into their MSW program at the University of Melbourne, um, even if those folks don't have an undergraduate degree, but mm -hmm. they qualify based on whatever kind of community service they've done, other ways they've been involved in any kind of, uh, you know, relevant work. So, you know, their own personal experiences and insider knowledges and, and, and experiences. And to me, I mean, and certainly in my lifetime, um, I don't think I'm ever going to see that on this continent. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think as an example of how to um, excessively queer, these institutions and then the discourses that support them around expertise, what kind of knowledge is, uh, you know, qualify one for an advanced degree, even the notion of having a, an advanced degree. But so, so to me, that's a great example of how um, um, we, we do what Kristen says is we interrogate some of these assumptions and how power is operating. And one way power operates in the academy is that you have to go through these, these things that just, have white supremacy baked yeah. into them. And as yeah. Dave mentioned earlier, if we're really entering um, a, a project of querying with a, a, um, uh, a nuanced critique of things, you know, the original queer projects were very intersectional, were very influenced by a class analysis and, and racial justice. Um, and so, so I think that, that that's, as we go close in to ideas of training, we also back up what are some of these fundamental bits of um, queer theory that, that we're trying to bring to life. I would I would add um, the the piece around, um, and I'm speaking from social, but I think it's very similar to other disciplines that um, Kristen and Julie teach. Is there is a um, a commitment to like in social work like core competencies or learning objectives that are very heteronormative, uncritiqued, and you're only supposed to teach certain, quote, evidence-based models or theories. And so it might mean querying that by um, integrating um, other disciplines, other ideas, other practices that tend to be marginalized in the academy, like including queer theory, but all the, all the theories that are like outlawed in Florida yeah. and other places like critical race theory and yeah. And so forth. So it might mean using one's privilege as an academic to bring forth traditions, uh, radical traditions, um, and and to really deconstruct what constitutes knowledge. That's great. Thank you. Okay, moving into practice, you write that therapies are welcoming and affirming of LGBTQ people. Uh, and inclusive, but uh, inclusive therapeutic practices are not always queer. And I'm wondering if you could say more about that. Kristen, go for it. <laughs> that, that's one of your handles. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we can be welcoming and friendly in our practices to queer and trans people without bringing a critical lens to the work that we're doing. I think it alludes to some of what you and Dave were just talking about when we're not paying attention to our own positionality, who we represent, what that means for a client, um, that we can we can be very welcoming and say, hey, I support, I support gender affirming care and I support same sex marriage. And, and a clinician can believe all of those things and say, hey, I work with queer couples. But they can also, in their practice, reaffirm all of those normative social power structures, right? So you can be welcoming without being like engaging in a critical, critical queer practice in terms of, and we're back to that kind of point of inquiry and investigating and um, deconstructing. So I think we're, to me, that's also very adjacent to the notion of affirming. It's like someone can show up to cognitive behavioral therapy or... Um, Bowenian therapy and be affirmed as a mm -hmm. lesbian or as a trans person, but baked into those approaches are very normative ideas, you know, uh, uh, uncritiqued of, you know, functioning health, kinship structures, things like this. And mm -hmm. those are all super politicized ideas. Health is a very po politicized idea that we don't 
I don't know how to define it. No one really does. Um, you know, functioning, kinship structures. And so, so to me, that's, it's, it's to just add on to what Kristen said, it, it's very attached to that notion of affirming, which is a low bar and you can be welcome, but it isn't necessarily queer. Yeah. And as a supervisor, I do have that experience of, right, you know, <laughs> of having to work with folks that have, that consider themselves uh, affirming, but you know, not so critical. And that's the, you know, and so that's one of our challenges, I think, as educators and supervisors and yeah. et cetera. So. Yeah. And I think one of the big questions that I think is so important to consistently ask students and trainees is how do they benefit from these systems? So, you know, we can, um, you know, we can be welcoming to a trans person, but we don't necessarily always want to interrogate for ourselves as cis people, how we benefit from the system that exploits or, um, you know, leaves out other people. And so when I talk about, when like or I've referenced accountability practices, that that's part of those accountability practices. So bringing that into the work that we're doing in a very intentional way, um, mm -hmm. I think is what really kind of sets queering your practice apart from like affirmative practices, as Julie was mentioning. I do want to state also that I, I can't escape those practices. It's in the air and water we breathe, right? So, Absolutely. Right. We've all been socialized into that. So it's like right. having conversations with folks like you and like continuing to try, you know, that's the work that has to be done over and over again, right? Yeah. Well, and I think what you're speaking to is so relevant that 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 also what you're alluding to is a, is more accountability practice. You don't show up to the training and become enlightened and now you're good. Yeah. This is an everyday intentional conscience, conscious, excuse me, and, uh, and conscience, I guess, <laughs> um, practice that we have to be intentional about. And, you know, as a trainer, I'm also wanting to encourage the people I'm working with to be accountable in their everyday practices too. I think anytime we, we think we've gotten it, um, we need to hang up the hat yeah. because there's always work to be done. I, I, would, I would just add, I really like the way that was language. That was you, Kristen, about yeah. it's inclusive, but queer is not, you know, always inclusive. I think the inclusivity and affirming discourses uh, only go so far. I mean, it's what Julie and Kristen are saying and it makes me think of Dean Spade's work uh, in a in his book, Normal Life, that critiques like equality and rights discourses. That it it's still um, situated within the current dominant social structures, and we need more of a transformational, radical potential. And I think like it might mean, in addition to doing gender affirming care within the healthcare system and mental health care system currently, but it also might mean. Um, you know, really challenging, you know, our healthcare system in general that requires trans folks to even have to see a therapist. Or, so okay. it's looking at a both and um, doing the work uh, as it currently exists and trying to be sub covert and subversive in some ways, but also simultaneously really standing back and looking at these um, systems that just reinforce uh, dominates and not really looking at like Christo fascism or neoliberalism, how that's seeping right. in that equality discourses and affirmation discourses um, can be appropriated by both neo fascist and neoliberal. Yeah. And, and Dave, I'd, I'd piggyback on what you were saying, like in terms of gender care for trans folks, it, to me, it's not only about removing the gatekeeping, um, you know, of any kind of letters and that crap, but it's also just sort of deinstitutionalizing transgender medicine. It's like, you yeah. know, free hormones, surgeries, whatever, it, it should just be there. Um, and so, so to me, that would be the extension of that as some people say, we shouldn't have to have gatekeeping a mental health letter for particular procedures, but there's still this idea of trans healthcare being situated in the institution, you know, medic institutionalized medicine. And there's, and you know, this is a bit off topic, but just, I think it's important to extend that idea of um, critiquing those institutions and that that's part of um, moving from affirming or friendly to um, queer. Transformational. Yeah. And trans yeah, a, a, a transformational approach. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, you also write that narrative therapy and many other postmodern approaches are queering therapeutic practice. Can you say more about that? 
you know, I, I guess I just say that as compared to, um, you know, uh, pr approaches that are informed more by liberal humanism and structuralism, you know, there's everything from therapist positionality um, to, uh, you know, move, trying to trying to move from the, the expert position to more uh, collaborative, you know, co-research, how, however we uh, like to think about that, that, that position, um, uh, you being decentered and influential, understanding that our expertise lays more in um, the conversational practices that we bring and the kind of conversations we can host versus the knowledge we're going to instill in, <laughs> in clients. So there's therapist positionality, there's bringing, um, you know, narrative uh, traditionally, at least as I've been taught and practice it is intentionally and um, um, uh, transparently political uh, by nature of working on the level of discourse. I think that that swims against the conventional uh, tide that we're of, of non post structural or construction influenced approaches. I, I hesitate to use the word postmodern, but that's my preference. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, I, so those sorts of things bring in curiosity, um, some of the collective practices that, that many of us try to use, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those come to mind in terms of the ways that I think that narrative approaches are in a sense, a queering, a going against the grain of conventional approaches that are influenced by more modernist ideas. Um, I, um, alongside what Julie said is, uh, you know, although narrative therapy, like most models that are taught in, in the, uh, in the academy and in our licensing boards, et cetera, it was developed by white cis men, mm -hmm. but the, the framework and the politics and the vocabularies, uh, create pathways or transformation that can be taken up in different communities and reworked in its own way. So I think there's that piece. And I think also just, uh, you know, a lot of narrative practice um, uh, borrows a lot from Foucault and other post-structuralists and queer theory is also drawing a, a, alongside those same theorists and ideas. So there's a an intersection there. Yeah. And I'll say, um... This is the kind of stuff that gets me in trouble. I oh. think narrative therapy is another practice that can also, it can be done without critical intention, without interrogation for ourselves. You know, if we think about it as a model we use with clients and we don't see ourselves in that system and how we benefit from those systems, I've seen some, I, I mean, in my day, I've seen some pretty problematic uh, practices by very yeah. well renowned narrative therapists in the narrative therapy world. So I think um, it's foundation of all of the, like the, when I think about the systemic theories that we train in an, an accredited MFT program, it is the, the approach that was developed with a social justice foundation. And at the same time, how we engage in it with clients, right. with ourselves, with our trainees, um, is still dependent on accountability practices, interrogation, paying attention to social structures, um, because we can also choose not to do that and be yeah. harmful in those practices. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just as an example, you both, you share some examples of like querying therapeutic conversations in the chapter. And I, I guess, Julie, I'm going to ask you, you write about an alternative to the conventional discourse of parental grief and loss and uh, that which is the narrative that maintains parents experience a loss and that must be grieved when their child declares they are transgender i wonder if you could say more about that example yeah and and i would also say that um i don't hear it so much now when and and i use child here to denote the relationship it doesn't necessarily mean a young person mm -hmm. but it could be an adult as well in relationship to their parents um Years ago, parents grieving the loss of, of their offspring coming out as gay or lesbian was a thing. I don't hear that so much anymore. Now it's really around people identifying, um, you know, in relationship with gender other than how they were assigned at birth, you know, or what we now know as transgender or non-binary folks. And so, it, you know, it makes perfect sense to me that what has been available to parents 
is this idea of grieving and loss because they haven't been prepared to imagine a world where people make relationships with our system of gender and what's available in that system. They haven't been prepared for what we call transgender people, you know, for, so they, when you think of all the things parents are prepared for, they are excessively prepared in so many ways for a child whose gender identity, what, you know, I, I traffic lightly in those terms, um, whose gender identity lines up with what the doctor declared at birth. And so parents, I do believe they experience grief or loss or in, you know, all these sorts of things because discursively they've been prepared for that. The problem with that, and if we see so many therapists um, who, you know, are pretty literate and, and, and supportive of trans folks jump right into this modernist liberal humanist idea of grief and loss as a necessary thing for parents to do before they can support and embrace their, um, uh, their child. Uh, and I think therapists do that because we're suckers for feelings. We tend to, in, in modernist pr approaches, for sure, really privilege feelings, right? I mean, we can, we don't, all four of us could go on forever about the history of that. Um, and so I, I'm trying to find, find a way to acknowledge and validate and support parents without centering them because it's a very much a centering of the parents. It's very much centering cis normativity. And it, it creates, I think I wrote something like uh, at a time that should be a celebration of life when, when trans folks are coming into some clarity and hopefulness about who they are, it, it becomes an elegy of death rather than a celebration of life. Mm -hmm. um, no one has died no one has been disappeared, um, but it's the loss of an idea, an idea of who they were because parents were set up with that. I've seen too many times, particularly young people, but uh, trans adults as well, kind of delay, um, delay um, coming out to their parents because they know they'll go through that. It ends up often centering parents' feelings and then trans folks are attending to that rather than uh, attending to what they may need. Um, and I think it also, um, it, it just, it's a way of obfuscating the gendered systems that everybody's influenced by. So, you know, uncritically accepting that, that parents have to grieve a loss, just kind of, you know, it, it, it creates the smokes and mirrors, you know, it's an obfuscation of, of cis normativity and the gender binary. Um, so I'm interested in finding some ways that allow parents to acknowledge those feelings, but then situate those feelings in the discourse. And, and so for me as a narrative therapist, um, you know, I understand feelings or reactions as responses to things. They're not something located in people. So I'm, you know, using double listening, I'm engaging in the absent, but implicit and wanting to tap into, um, uh, you know, what it is that parents, how they want to show up for people. So uh, I do what I call parent mission interviews. And and most, you know, rarely once parents start talking about their intentions or aspirations as parents, rarely does it have anything to do require uh, parenting a particular gendered mm -hmm. child. Um, when I ask them what they value, or appreciate or admire about their kids, rarely it's well, they're straight and cis. It's, it's, it's ways of being in the world, knowledges their kids have that may be gendered in our world that, you know, they're very kind and, and big hearted. That may be gendered female, but it doesn't require a female identification to be tender and kind hearted. Mm -hmm. um, so so those are the, the the that's the critique and some of the intentions that I have in um, trying to gauge parents. Uh, in, in a different kind of conversation. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you know, Kristen has done a lot of thinking and talking and frankly has um, gotten in a little bit of trouble, I think, speaking out sometimes about this. So I don't know if there's something I missed or, or something you'd want to put a better point on. No, and I'm sorry, I got kicked out of Zoom for a moment. So I missed a little bit of what you said, but um, 
what I would add, and hopefully you haven't already said this, is I also just think about in practice at a point in time where a child, adult or young, however old they are, has either been found out or disclosed who they are in the world. Um, I mean, I think like, isn't that a moment of celebration and, you know, at a point where they are potentially experiencing a sense of, of liberation and freedom to treat that like it's something to be grieved, like it's equivalent to a death. And I think about, you know, when we do that, as much as I, I, I share all of the sentiments that that Julie shared um, in regards to wanting to support parents and, and hearing what this is like for them, given the discourse that they are socialized in and the, the, what they have available to them, I, I also think about who are we centering in those conversations? Who is most vulnerable? And I mean, we can go on about the vulnerability, particularly of trans youth. And so when we think about who's vulnerable in that system and whose experience we're centering, we're a little off when we really embrace that grief narrative in terms of who needs the support and, and who do I want to see survive? Um, you know, it, it, it positions it for me, it pos- positions the conversation a little bit differently. Um, while I still certainly want to be compassionate with parents and, and hear what's happening for them. Um, that's the question I oftentimes will pose to students. Like yeah. who, who are we centering in this? Right. The, the final thing that I'd like to add, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. And, and this, I think it pushes the envelope a bit. It's a further querying is that there's plenty of folks, therapists, parents who say, you know, they're, they're very supportive. They're, you know, they're, they're down at the legislators, uh, you know, they're, they're doing all these things yet there's implied, if not a, a explicitly stated, a notion that being trans is, so to speak, not not a preferred outcome. And I would say, particularly at this political moment, without a full chested, being trans is, is absolutely good and valued and cherished and desired. It's a compromised kind of support. You know, I've heard plenty of parents, the ones that are, you know, marching in pride, that are at their legislators saying, I wouldn't wish this on anyone. And to me, you know what 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 I, what I'm hoping you're not wishing is you know this this oppressive gender system mm-hmm. that does so much violence and harm to particular people, especially trans people. But I know what they're meaning. Well, you know, I love my trans kid, but I wouldn't wish this on anyone. And and that's that's not where the energy needs to go. And so we have to, with our full chest, say, yeah. Being trans is good, and I would welcome that in in myself or anyone or anybody's kid. And if you're not able to do that, you know, I invite you to, you know, go sit down with your beer or your coffee and think a little bit more before you sit in front of trans people and say that you're uh, there to help. (laughs) Thank you for that. And thank you for that great example of queering therapy to practice. Appreciate it. Um, And you brought up legislation. I live in a city that the city council just banned the pride flag is going after the library. And you're seeing what David described as Christo fascist uh, inroads into school boards like this, this there, it's just, I don't know what to say. Anyway, but my question are what are, what are the ways that we can counter the continual wave of crystal fascist legislation and violence that attempts to eliminate queer and trans people? Do you have any thoughts about it? I know that's a big question, but. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what we said to each other when we yeah. read the questions. Like, well, that's big. <laughs> yeah, right. one, one thought I had about that, Chris, is um, you're in California as I am. Yeah. And, and there's this like a uh, temptation to think, that in California, right. uh, we're just super progressive, and it can be uh, really problematic in terms of not paying attention to what's happening on these local levels, like your school board. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, it, it, like othering, like, oh, that's in that's Florida, that's in the South, that's not happening here in California. Or I also live part time in Michigan, but it's seeping in there. So it's, I think, partly to be aware of that i think one other thought i had was just there's a lot you know i mentioned kristen and and julie have a lot to say is um it might mean really um putting yourself out there as a therapist and outside of the therapy office because i i i think there's this like interesting 
connection between the rise of neo-fascism and Christo-fascism legislation, neoliberalism, the solution becomes therapy and not getting outside in, in, in community and transformational work. So mm-hmm. um, it, it might mean like in um, some, some stuff I've done is um, like working with a trans adult or youth who lives in a state that's banned trans affirming care that I will see them via Zoom and and write a letter, um, which could be seen as on one level unethical, but I think it's quite quite the opposite. So th- those are a couple ideas. Thank you. Yeah. Kristen, you want to throw something out? <laughs> yeah, I think um, I don't know. This might go a little bit beyond the the question, but something that I've been talking quite a bit more about our kind of our ethical responsibility as systems thinkers to be engaged in systems change. And yes, do we do that as we engage in our offices with families, with individuals? You know, of course we do, or I hope we do. Um, But also there's so much, I mean, when, if I am benefiting from the systems that are the reason that these, that folks are showing up in my office, I feel like I have a responsibility to be working to change those systems not with the gaze of my clients even there, but that I have some responsibility to be showing up in a, in a variety of ways. And we all have different ways that we want to, sh- that we might be comfortable or, or able to show up. So it might be through legislative action and advocacy there. It might be showing up and handing out water at a protest. Um, you know, it's, it's being in community with the people who are most vulnerable, listening to what their needs are and working to to do that work in community and in relationship outside of what I'm doing in in my therapy room. Um, That, you know, that resistance doesn't start and end when, you know, we, the clock starts for our 50 minute hour. Um, So that's something that I think is just incredibly important and, and, um, I just don't think I can claim to be like a, a systems thinker if I'm not willing to engage in higher level systemic change. Mm-hmm. So um, trying to add some things that these two haven't thrown out there. I, 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 uh, I do a variation on the theme, Harleen Anderson's theme of uh, go, slow down to hurry up. And I, and I say, go small to go big. Mm-hmm. And, and so some of that starts in our offices uh, with some of the querying practices and particularly the, the practices of accountability and interrogation of our own um, complicity and benefit of, of some of the, the s- institutions and discourses that um, are harmful and, and can make way for crystal fascism. And also there's this blurry line between neoliberalism and fascism that I think we're all kind of seeing how we're writing that right now. So some of the go small to go big is I think, you know, my invitation to therapists is to really try to engage it in addition to um, outside of the office stuff like Kristen is talking and Kristen and Dave are talking about is in your office. What are some collective practices you can start doing more of? How, I always think of, I always tell people, my job is to get out of your life. And part of the way I facilitate that is to make sure they have other people. Yeah. Um, and, and I think lots of people are, um, Dave at least um, alluded to this, I think people are showing up in therapy um, somewhat disbelonged or disconnected. And, 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 and I'm really concerned about continuing to do therapy particularly with an individual, um, you know, not a relationship. Um, I'm really concerned about becoming this placeholder of connection, belonging, and purpose for people. Um, and so I think about how can I help people get connected in the community? Um, because, and to me, that is a go small to go big act of resistance to fascism because divided is how we fall and they really want to faction us off. And we see that in how, cisgender gay and lesbians are not like going hmm, maybe to trans folks do we really should we slow this down and i'm like there's nowhere in our history and queer history where trans people are not actually what we now call trans people aren't centered and in fact even and this is a whole other can of worms the division between gender and sexuality there's really nowhere in our history so to me that's part of those are a couple things i think about i also think about um um that being at your legislature and doing those things is important, but to remember that 
that legislation and civil rights, these are harm reduction practices. They are not transformational. We are not going to vote someone in that's going to fucking save us mm -hmm. or, or cramps people. I mean, it just hasn't ever happened. It's not going to happen. Um, it, there's a million reasons. And so, um, you know, I encourage people to, Dave Ruffin's Dean, Dean Spade speaks really well to this. Um, Chase Strangio, the ACLU lawyer, speaks really well to this. Jules Gill Peterson, who is a uh, black trans scholar. Uh, she's a historian of childhood. Um, she speaks really well to this. So it's a, so it's a both and. We vote, we go to the legislature, we do that, but th that you can't hang your head on that. And that's where I go back to these small practices of, of mutual aid, of collective practices. Um, and uh, I think that knowing history is really important. Uh, so like a lot with queer and trans youth, you know, we'll sit there online looking up some history together and helping them see themselves as part of something bigger mm -hmm. um, and part of, uh, because right now they, they, they're they freaking out because they've grown up in a time with much more um, exposure, representation, and knowing that they're they can, you know, like, you know, I am certainly old enough. Kristen's old enough. Like we didn't, you know, we survived some other shit, you know? And I think that's important too, not as a rose colored glasses, but that that is hope that is situated in history and in situated in people's DIY practices of surviving other stuff. And so those are some of my sort of go small to go big ideas uh around what we can do because it's very overwhelming like it's a big question you're going to ask the three of us how to like oh well <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that those are some of the things that i would add awesome i think uh, can i add to that yeah, too of course, of course. I, mean, I think resistance is important and sometimes that also means like if, if we are really going to show up in a way to resist this um, elimination of queer and trans people. I appreciate that you use that word because I, th I think, you know, a bathroom bill, it's about eliminating people. If you cannot go out and have a place to pee, you can't exist in our, in our society. I mean, you have to stay home. Right. I mean, so um, I just, I I'm taking students on a study abroad in, in a little over a week to Berlin. And so we've been talking about Hirschfeld's work in sex research in, in Germany and how his offices were raided by the Nazi regime, which created the pink lists and the Holocaust. Hmm. And then we connected that to what's happening in Florida and the governor's um, attempts to get the list of students who have received trans affirming care and higher education. They're not so far apart. Um, so that history, I just want to reemphasize what Julie's saying about like knowing the history, but then also thinking about how do we engage in that resistance? You know, for example, if I was ever asked to share that information, even if my license is on the line, no way, no hell, like not happening, right? Like so there are sometimes ways that we have to take a risk in order to um, engage in the resistance to protect people because we are at a point where lives are at stake. I mean, you know, and I don't feel like I'm being, um, you know, over the top or dramatic when I say that. And so I, I just wanted to add that piece that it, it's, it feels very scary to people. And the other piece that I'll add it just because this came up with the students the other day is we're, we're going to one of the biggest um, uh, queer and trans street festivals in Europe when we're, when we're in Berlin um, next in a couple of weeks. And the students and I were talking and they were concerned about mass shootings. We just had a pride um, march here in Boone, North Carolina, a little mountain town. And before we stepped off, we had um, instructions on what to do in the event of an active shooter. And so, um, you know, there is a fear that queer and trans people are walking around with right now, given, I mean, there's a reason that there is a, a travel advisory in the United States right now for queer and trans people um, that people are, are living with. And so when I even think about in, how we engage in these conversations, my students were looking up the gun laws in Germany and felt very relieved that you can't own a semi-automatic weapon because when we go to the street festival, they're less likely to get shot. And it, I just walked away from that conversation going, this is where we're at right now. You know, so how do we, 
how do we engage in the resistance? It might not only be around legislative issues related to queer and trans inclusion. It has to do with gun laws. It has to, you know, it has to do with so many other facets of our society, culture, rules, laws um, that we have to be engaged in if if we really want to work towards the, um, I, mean, I mean, I think, I think the, the, liberation, but also just the safety for folks who are in the crosshair right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that tying that back up, Kristen, is really important that when we, again, it's not that, that queer, queer issues are issues of, you know, uh, economic justice, of uh, you know, disability, all these things. And, and so that, these ideas, uh, it's, it's not just around sex and gender, it's its all this stuff that that allows people access because if queer and trans people, particularly of color, are, are, are marginalized even further. And um, uh, when you talked about the travel advisory, it's like, yeah, that's crazy. But also what's crazy to me is how come there hasn't been a travel advisory in this country forever for people of color? Yeah. You know, and so that would be, you know, right, a further extension of that. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have one final question for you all and I, that I like to ask of all the guests that come on The Radical Therapist. And this has been a wonderful conversation. I appreciate you taking the time to do it. But the last question I have is what books, films, ideas, thinkers are capturing your attention these days? What's getting you uh that was my, uh, all your questions are good, but I really uh, uh, like that question. I'm chomping at the bit. To, awesome. Fire away. I, I like to read, you know, a novel in a nonfiction. So there's this, I would really highly recommend this novel. It's called, um, I want to make sure I get the name right. The School for Good Mothers, a novel. And it's, it's a dystopian novel where um, a single parent, um, uh of a like i think a three or four year old maybe a five year old um leaves her kid alone for very briefly to go to the grocery store or something she is the daughter of chinese immigrants and she has a really tough job working um at a university in philadelphia but she gets reported by um child welfare and she has to go to the state reform school to become a good parent and it's a very um, compelling uh, analysis of our child welfare system and a state policing system. And it kind of is in line with, um, you know, 1984, Handmaid's Tale, but it's a really, really amazing book. It's, 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 it's her first novel, J Jasmine Chan, but I highly recommend it, The School for Good Mothers. And then um, from um, more, more of a nonfiction, I'm really, really... Um, inspired by the work of Wendy Brown. I'm not sure if people are familiar with Wendy Brown. Oh, yeah. She wrote a book uh, in 2019 called In the Ruins of Neoliberalism, The Rise of Anti-Democratic Politics in the West. And um, it's an amazing analysis of how neoliberalism um, looks different in a neo-fascist state. So like neoliberalism um, had a certain kind of sense of morality or like equality and a, a vision um, based on market-based solutions. But with the rise of neo-fascism, neoliberalism takes new forms that are um, like nihilistic and um, like almost like ap apocalyptic. So it's a really good book. She, she has a new book that just came out on nihilism and Max Weber's um, ideas. Um, She's a professor at Berkeley and her partner is uh, Judith Butler. Hmm. And I like her, I like her writing better than Judith Butler. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, I, I've read Wendy Brown too. It's like, wow, I wonder what a conversation in their house sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> Kristen, what are you into? Um, gosh, I thought about this and I have a couple of answers. I would say, um, I am rereading Austin Channing Brown's book. Um, I'm still here. Uh, a black dignity in a world made for whiteness. It's just an incredible story. And I think um, sometimes you know, like theory, con you know, conceptual books are great, but hearing people's stories and their lived experience, I think is really powerful. And she's, um, 
she she holds me to a new place of accountability. I think every time I read her in terms of my whiteness um, and what I do with that and how I operate in a white body. Um, so her and, and along with her, the first time I actually heard her speak was at a white Christian conference. So I also, um, Nadia Boltz Weber is such an incredible thinker. Um, cause I think about the relationship between the work that we do and traditional notions of Christianity. And there's so many different ways to be Christian. And that is oftentimes the, the barrier, the reason that people use to not queer practice, to not engage, to not support certain kinds of people. And so to, um, to read and listen to these like really incredible thinkers about how they've conceptualized and challenged their own relationship with, with God and faith communities is just powerful and moving to me. Um, and, and it's just, I don't know, resource isn't the right word, but it's like a different kind of resource. So, um, yeah. And then I think the thing that like this week has really, well, I'm in North Carolina, so I'm trying to just kind of navigate what's been happening here this week in terms of legislative action. Um, super problematic. I won't get into all of that, but the, the, the shining light this week, the silver lining, um, my, my dear friend and colleague Russ Toomey um, sued the state of Arizona. And in response to that case, which was uh, taken up by the ACLU, um, the governor of Arizona signed an executive order um, banning, um, you know, so-called reparative therapy efforts or sexual orientation, gender identity change efforts and therapy, as well as um, covering for the state health insurance plan to cover gender affirming care. Um, for state employees. And, and that was the the premise of um, Dr. Toomey's case. So, um, and of course he, and he is an out um, trans man and this has not gone without um, personal sacrifice for him. He has been targeted. He continues since this, this executive order was signed, he's continued to be targeted by TERFs, by, you know, different um, political persuasion representatives. Um, and so um, I just, I've been thinking about him quite a bit about, you know, this is like this, incredible moment of progress. And I also look at like, what are the consequences to that as well? What are the personal consequences that people take when, when they are willing to put themselves out there to create bigger changes for, for others? So two books that I'd suggest for pe people. One is Jenny O'Dell's um, How to Do Nothing. Um, I forget the subtitle, but basically she, it, it's a look at how the, the attention economy steals from us. And she does a really nice, really interesting deep dive into history and philosophy uh, around mm -hmm. attention and what that means to pay attention. Um, and for anybody that um, uh, maybe wants to renegotiate their relationship with the socials and doom scrolling and <laughs> FOMO, um, I think she offers um a uh, really nuanced and wise um uh, uh some wise ideas around that the other book um that i've just dipped into because it just came out a few weeks ago is by um uh two of my favorite activist organizers uh kelly hayes and mariam kaba it's called let this radicalize you What's the subtitle? Organizing the Revolution of Reciprocal Care. So it's a lot about mutual aid and sustainability and activist movements and things like that. And um, so I've just started dipping into it. But again, these are two people who I've read before, listen to their podcasts. And so I'm very hopeful about it uh, being a good resource. Wonderful. One, I, I lied. One final question. How do people find you all? What's the quick, what's the easiest way if people want to reach out to you to get in touch with you? Well, if someone wants to send me a cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm at Julie at two, the digit, not the word, two stories, S-T-O-R-I-E-S dot com, or my website is two stories dot com. Um, that's probably a fine way to find me. Great. Kristen or David? Kristen? Yeah, um, I'm pretty easy to find uh, uh, just... <laughs> K Kristen K R I S T E N um, B E N S O N. Um, if you get onto the Google machine, currently I'm at um, Appalachian State. Um, starting in January, I will be at Virginia Tech. So, um, but I'm I'm easily Googleable these days. So um, I look forward to hearing from anyone. Uh, 
I, I think probably the best is my email through um, Sacramento State, DK Nyland, N Y L U N D, at csus.edu. Awesome. And you'll be at the big narrative therapy conference in Vancouver, David? Yeah, I will be. Okay. For people that are interested. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. This has been wonderful. I appreciate you taking the time and, and sharing with us. And um, just thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Chris. You for having us. I'll also point out we're all wearing um, t shirts that kind of represent, I don't know, for <laughs> everyone. So, so if you're just listening, come to the YouTube <laughs> channel and come see the shirts everybody's wearing. It's awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Take care, thank everybody. You.